We're building a machine that's instruction set compatible with Ben Eater's Simple as Possible 1. We're using fewer parts, but we do use much larger EEPROMs. In the last video, we built the finite state machine, which I've also called the rule book elsewhere, and hopefully the reason for that will become evident in this video. I said that these two optal D type flip flops were the trickiest part of the design, and a lot of this video will be spent on explaining their purpose. I have to explain a little bit of computer science theory. I know just saying those words can trigger the off button in the brain. But if you've come this far along the journey, I really want you to pay attention for the next 10 or 15 minutes. For some of you, I'm hoping this is where the penny drops on how computers really work and how to build your own. Now, let's have a look at what we've built so far. We use the state machine to generate this Knight Rider pattern, but it turns out there are other things we can do with our state machine, like arithmetic. Let's say we want to add two numbers, A and B, where A and B are both signed 8 bit numbers. We can present the value of B first, and based on our current state, this goes through the EEPROM without being modified. Then on the positive edge of clock, it's latched into the feedback pathway. Next, we present A, and the EEPROM uses a lookup table to compute the sum of A plus B. The value of A is presented on the W bus, but the value of B is stored in our state variable. The last few remaining bits of the state tell us to use this lookup table. And the lookup table's big. It's got 64,000 entries. Then finally, on the next positive edge of a clock, this gets presented at the output. We can do something very similar for subtraction. Again, we present B first. Then we use a lookup table in the EEPROM to invert all the bits and add 1. This generates minus B. On the next positive edge of clock, we load these into our feedback flip flops. We present A on the input, and now our addition lookup table sees A and minus B. It adds these together and produces the output of A minus B. Then, on the next positive edge of clock, this gets sent to the output. So I hope you can see that I've been able to replace the adder that Ben Eater used in his SAP1 with some lookup table space in our finite state machine. I'll go over exactly how this is programmed in the next video. This leads to an important question. Is our finite state machine a general purpose computer? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Let's look at another example where we simplify our arithmetic down to a single digit and we have a lookup table for addition and multiplication. We use address bit 4 to decide which operation we're doing, 0 for addition and 1 for multiplication. The lower address bits, A0 through A3, are our new number, while bits A5 to A8 are our fedback number. All the numbers that are valid are in black, whereas all the numbers that have overflowed are in grey. We'll try to keep our computation down to a single digit. The reason I sometimes call this the rule book is it's because it's containing a bunch of rules telling us how to add or multiply two numbers together. Let's try to solve the equation 1 times 2 plus 3, which we all know equals 5. We start with a running tally of 0. Now we want to add 1. We go through our addition lookup table, which says 0 plus 1 is 1, so the EEPROM outputs a 1, and then on the next positive edge of clock, this becomes our new feedback number. Next, we have a 1 being fed in the top, and we see the times too. Now we look up our multiplication table, and we see that 1 times 2 is 2. So that gets output from the EEPROM, and then on the next positive edge of clock, this becomes our running tally that's fed back. We see a plus 3. We use our addition lookup table. The answer is 5, so that gets output from the EEPROM. And that's the correct answer for the equation so far. Let's look at a similar example of 1 plus 2 times 3, which is equal to 7. The finite state machine starts with 0, it sees the plus 1, it looks up the answer, which is 1. This gets fed back as our running tally. We see a plus 2. So the EEPROM looks up 1 plus 2, which is 3. This gets outputted. Now, our upper number is 3, and we see a times 3, 
And so we look that up and we get the answer nine. Now, this is clearly wrong. The answer is seven. But our finite state machine can't solve this problem by itself. What we need is a way to remember the plus one up front, then multiply two by three to get six, and then apply the remembered plus one to give us seven. Hopefully from this simple example, you can see why a finite state automata by itself isn't a general purpose computer. The problem only gets worse as the equation gets longer. What we need is some form of memory, like a stack. You can think of this as being like a stack of plates. We can add a plate to the top or take away a plate from the top. But to get to the information on the yellow plate, we have to remove the blue, cyan and black plates. The information on those plates may have been used to update the state, but the exact information stored on the plates is now gone. Let's go back to this more complicated equation. I can write it in a form called Reverse Polish Notation, or RPN. The numbers are still in the same order, just some of the other symbols have been moved to make it more friendly for a stack. This still can't be solved by the finite state machine alone. Some of you may remember the Hewlett Packard line of calculators that used Reverse Polish Notation. Putting a plate on the stack is called pushing, so let's see if we can solve this equation. We push the 7, then we push the 5, and then we see this minus symbol. The minus symbol tells us to pop or take off the top two elements and subtract one from the other. Then we push the result, which is 2 in this case, back onto the stack. Next, we push the 2 and then push the 3. Then we see the plus symbol. This tells us to take the 3 and the 2 off, add them together and push the result, which is 5, back onto the stack. We do this again for the 5 and the 3. Pop them and add them. We get 8, so we push that to the stack. But then we hit this multiplication symbol. This tells us to take off the two top elements, multiply them together and push that back onto the stack. Now we have 40 on top of the stack, we push the 2, and then we see the minus symbol, so we subtract 2 from 40 to get 38. We see the multiplication symbol, this tells us to pop the 38 and the 2 off the stack, multiply them together, and push the resulting 76 back onto the stack, and we're done. Now, provided we have a large enough stack, we can handle an arbitrarily complicated equation with as many brackets, multiplies, and pluses as we want. Now don't worry if you didn't follow every detail of that last example. The main take-home point is that the stack stores the intermediate values required to solve the equation. Okay, the finite state automata with the stack is good for solving these bracketed type problems. But are there any other problems in computer science that it can't solve? Well, let's consider a palindrome. So a palindrome is a word or a sentence which is spelt the same way whether you're going backwards or forwards. So the saying, never odd or even, is a palindrome because each letter has a matching letter the same distance in from the other direction. The third letter in from the left is a V, and the third letter in from the right is a V. Can a finite state automata with a stack determine whether a word's a palindrome or not? Let's have a look. The word race car is also a palindrome. We see the letter R and we remember it. Then we see the A and we push it to the stack. Next we see the C, so we push that to the stack as well. We keep doing this with all the remaining letters until we've reached the end of the word. We check the top of the stack. That's an R, which matches our remembered letter, so we can remove that. Next, we see the A. We remember it, and then remove it. Then we keep removing letters till we get to the bottom of the stack. We find that the A on the bottom of the stack matches our remembered letter, so we can get rid of this. But now, there's nothing to do. We haven't actually checked all of the letters in the original word. Our finite state machine with a stack can't differentiate race car from rat's car when it comes to palindromes. This type of machine isn't classified as a general purpose computer.
Its official name is a pushdown automata. If you're still with me, we're nearly there, just a little bit more to go. What if our memory is a one-dimensional tape, where we can only move one box left or one box right at a time? But we can read whatever's in the box, and if we want to, we can erase it and write something else. So here we have never odd or even. We start at the left, see the N, cross it off, then go to the other end and see if there's an N there as well. We find an N, so we cross that off, and we test the next letter, which is an E in this case. We mark that off, but remember that we're looking for an E. We then go to the right, check for an E, it's there, and so we cross that off as well. We keep going backwards and forwards, crossing off letters one at a time, until we find a pair that don't match, or we don't have any letters left. Hopefully you can see that this type of machine can identify a palindrome correctly. If we find a mismatch, it's not a palindrome, but if we can cross off all the letters, it is. Let's check something that's not a palindrome, like Mad Hatter. We start with the M, we remember it and cross it off. Then we scoot over to the end of the word. We see the letter R, which doesn't match our remembered M. So we stop and reject this as a palindrome. A finite state machine with a sequential, one-dimensional read-write tape is known as a Turing machine. So what can't be computed on a Turing machine? Well, no one's found an example of a problem that can be solved by another machine, but not by a Turing machine. Okay, maybe that's being slightly overdramatic, but maybe not. So a Turing machine is considered to be a general purpose computer. You might be thinking to yourself, would anyone be silly enough to actually build a machine that uses sequential memory? Well, the answer is yes, me. But that's the subject of a different video, which is linked above. Let's have a bit of a break from the theory for now. The next part on the build list that I want to discuss is the 628128, which is a 128k static RAM. Now this part's a little bit of an overkill, given that I only really need 23 bytes of storage. But they're cheap, I have plenty of them, and who knows, I might need the space later. There are two fundamental differences between ROM and RAM. RAM is volatile, which means when the power goes off, the RAM loses its contents. The other major difference is that during common use, we can only read from the ROM, but we can read and write to the RAM. I want to connect the random access memory up to the state machine, but I need to do it in a way that still acts as a Turing machine. If I connect it the wrong way, it may end up being a stack, and I'll never be able to emulate Ben Eater's SAP1. Going back to the Turing machine, I'm going to call this green arrow my tape pointer. This just points to the box we're interested in, and I'm only allowed to increment it or decrement it by one each time. I want to be able to read and write from the memory, so I'm going to connect the data lines up to the W bus, whereas I connect the address lines to this up-down counter. This is now my tape pointer. I have a left, right bar control signal coming out of the state machine, and in the context of a one-dimensional tape, left and right is the same as up and down. This means the state machine can only increment or decrement the tape pointer by one each cycle. Hopefully, this isn't a huge conceptual leap from the diagram we had before. If this doesn't make sense to you, you may want to replay this section over again. As computer architects, here we get to the fun bit. What if we change this up-down counter to a regular set of D-type flip-flops? And we'll call this the memory address register. Is this now still Turing Complete? If I haven't mentioned it already, Turing Complete just means that it's capable of emulating a Turing machine. Let's say our finite state machine has full read-write access to the memory address register, as well as full read-write access to the random access memory. 
if I restrict the operations that the finite state machine can do to the memory address register to being just increment by one or decrement by one, then the memory address register acts as a tape pointer and the machine is Turing complete. Now, we don't have to use the memory this way, but the fact that we can makes it Turing complete. This type of machine is actually known as a random access machine. What if I change it so that the finite state machine can read and write the static RAM? but it can only write to the memory address register. It can't directly read it. Can I still make this into a Turing machine and show that it's Turing complete? If it is, then I can emulate Benita's SAP1. Well, what if I take 256 bytes of memory and move the tape pointer to be a variable located at byte zero? If the state machine just blindly writes zero into the memory address register, it points at the tape pointer. I can read and write the tape pointer, incrementing and decrementing it at will. Then use this address to reference actual data on the tape. Let's look at an example. Here the state machine remembers that it wants to go left before it does anything. This is left over from the previous cycle. It outputs a zero which gets latched into the memory address register. And let's say the tape pointer contains the value A7. This gets read into the state machine which sees A7 and left, and it produces the result A6, which then gets saved back into the tape pointer. The A6 is also latched into the memory address register. We fetch the data at this location and present it to our finite state machine. It changes the 29 to a 39 based on its internal state and remembers that it wants to go right next. Finally, it writes 39 over the 29 that was at location A6. It can still act as a sequential memory, we just have the added overhead of reading and writing the tape pointer variable every cycle, and either incrementing or decrementing it each time. Now, this may be enough to emulate Benita's SAP1, but I'm not really happy with this solution. It limits our tape size to 255 bytes, and we know that a Turing machine can have an infinite memory. And yes, 255 is much less than infinity. What if we have two memory address registers and we use two bytes to store the tape pointer? I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but first we reset the memory address registers. We read the value D2 in the tape pointer lower variable. We increment it, write it back to tape pointer low, and remember it. Next, we write 1 into the memory address register low. We read this value into our finite state machine. This time, we only increment or decrement it if the lower address crossed a page boundary, otherwise we leave it unchanged. We then write it back to tape pointer high, we write into the memory address register high, and finally, we write the D3 that we've been remembering in our state into memory address register low. Our memory address registers now hold the same values as our tape pointer registers, so this means that this can act as a sequential memory, and therefore it's Turing complete. The problem with this occurs here. It essentially means that each state needs a 64k lookup table. Even I'm not crazy enough to do that. There may be some way to store the state in the main memory, which means we don't need this big table for each state, but the problem will blow out when we go to a 24 or a 32 bit address bus. I'm going to suggest another solution, which is to have an entirely separate memory space for our variables. This has its own addressing register, which is directly connected to the finite state machine. Here I've called it the notepad register, which is 4 bits wide. We set it to be 0, we read the D2, we write back D3, and we also write it into our memory address register low. In fact, we can make this automatic, but I'll come back to this idea a bit later. Next, we write a 1 into the notepad register. We read the 3B at tape pointer high. We adjust it if appropriate, then we write it back to the same location and we write it into the memory address high register. This memory system also acts as a sequential access memory, and therefore the whole machine's Turing complete. Interestingly, because the notepad pointer is 4 bits wide, I could actually make my tape pointer 16 bytes wide. That would give me an address space of 128 bits, or 340,000 decillion bytes. And that's close enough to infinity for now. While I have to be able to form a sequential memory if necessary, I don't necessarily need to use it that way. 
In fact, I'd be kind of crazy to. Instead, what I'm going to do is put all the variables I need to emulate Ben Eater's SAP1 into the notepad space. And because we only use 16 bytes of memory, I only need one memory address register. I've made it 8 bits here, but in fact, I could have made it 4 bits. So, these two registers you see here are our mystery registers that we added in part one. That felt like a trip around the world, but we got there eventually. If you can understand how I got to this point, then the rest of the design should be pretty straightforward. Now I'm going to add another two bits to the state and the output from the notepad register the memory address register and the notepad register form an address bus going into the static RAM. The data lines on the static RAM connect back to the W bus. We do need some glue logic to make this work, and I'll go over that in the next video. Going back to the build, let's add the static RAM to the design. Connect up the notepad addresses from the memory address register. The bidirectional data bus on the static RAM connects up to the W bus, just as it did in Ben Eater's design. For those that were wondering, here's the reason why I had to make that 8th bit a wire rather than part of the printed circuit board. Basically, it was so the static RAM would fit. Ben Eater's SAP1 also has an output register. I'll wire up another 574 to our W bus, and I'll use this as our output register in a similar way. I had to cut the corner off this jumper to get it to fit next to the static RAM, but it seems to go in just fine now. Another 574 going in. Again, just ignore the 578 label. That was a mistake. One last time. Let's see if the Knight Rider pattern still works. That looks good. I think I'll retire the use of the intro theme, though. Here are bits 8 and 9 going back into the EEPROM. I need to connect up the four pins from the notepad address register into the static RAM. I just add them to our existing NP bus. While I'm wiring all of this up, I want to talk a bit about the next video. I'll go over the clock circuitry and some of the glue logic, but mostly I'm going to be going over how to program the EEPROM. There should be a link below to a GitHub repository. There you'll be able to find the schematic and a file called tsap1.zip. This file contains the binaries for the EEPROM, but perhaps more importantly, it contains the program used to generate the EEPROM. It contains an emulator, which is only a couple of lines of code. It uses Microsoft Visual Studio 22, which is available free of charge from the Microsoft website. I will be going into a lot of detail in the next video, but I'd encourage you to download it and have a look at it yourself first. I think it'll really help to understand the next video. Anyway, I'm nearly done here. I'm just wiring up the four address lines between the notepad pointer register and the memory address register. Unfortunately, there was no simple way to make a jumper for this. That's it for now. And don't forget to like, share and subscribe. I'm going to leave you with a bit of a problem, and I'm sure the answer will eventually come out in the comments. But have a go yourself before looking. A finite state automata with one stack is not a general purpose computing machine. But what about a finite state automata with two stacks? Can this be made Turing complete? Answers below.